All right, it is about that time. I'm not going to make you guys wait any longer. We're going to get this started. I'm going to introduce myself one more time. My name is Bethany. I am the program and volunteer coordinator for the Everett Rail Marshfield Public Library. I am so happy that you were able to join us this evening for Garden Guru. This evening we'll be covering butterfly gardens. Uh, if you have any questions or any issues related to like the technology or just general questions, you can use the chat down below. It will say chat. On the mobile, it's like if you swipe to a different screen, you can find it, I believe. I don't use the mobile very often, but it is in there as well. And if you have any questions specifically to our topic today or to the topic of general gardening for our speaker to respond to, you can utilize the Q&A option, which is also found at the bottom of your screen and should also be found in the same general area as the chat feature. Uh, further, I think that is all I really have for that basic information. Um, I think I'm going to turn this over to Donna. Donna is a Wood County Master Gardener Volunteer. Did I do that in the right yeah. order? Yes. I say it so often, you'd think I would know, but it's a lot. <laughs> And we're so lucky to have her here with us this evening. Thank you so much. I'm going to mute myself and turn my camera off so I do not distract at all, but I am here. So I'm helping assist with any questions or any issues as they come up. And I'm... Okay, we're going to talk about uh, butterfly gardens tonight. Um, and this is a kind of a popular topic with a lot of people. So we'll get right to the um, program. Okay, why are butterflies important? Um, one thing is they produce thousands of caterpillars every year, which are an important food source for birds and other species. Um, they did a little research. One brood of Carolina chickadees, that means one nestful, consumed 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars um, in one nesting. And if you multiply that by the number of birds who use caterpillars for food, you have uh, a reason to have gazillions of caterpillars for um, a season. Another thing is butterflies are pollinators along with bees, ants, bats, beetles, birds, flies, moths, and wasps. 90% uh, of the world's plants produce flowers and fruits or seeds, which are mainly used for food for humans and animals. If we didn't have pollinators, uh, it's estimated that the world would last about four years and we would be done as a species. And above all, they are beautiful and interesting creatures, which is the most important reason that most people look at butterfly gardening as a hobby. Um, getting started, with pollinators in serious decline, it is more important than ever for people to take part in con conservation. One of the most rewarding ways to, to do this is by creating a butterfly habit or a pollinator habit in your own garden. And these are some of the steps you need to do to um, get you started. You have to understand for butterfly gardening, if you want to attract butterflies, you have to have two kinds of plants in your garden. You need to have nectar plants, and those are the ones that we think of most often when we see butterflies flitting around um, in our garden and landing on flowers and um, eating and probing the flowers. Um, and so you think of that right away, but also you need to have host plants. And these are the plants that adults lay their eggs on. And these are the plants that the caterpillars will eat until they turn into butterflies. If you don't have the host plants, you probably aren't going to get a lot of the adults. Um, if you are trying to attract a specific kind of butterfly, you have to know what the host plant is and then you need to plant that. It may take a year or two or three to get the butterflies to find those host plants, but they eventually will, especially if there's a concentrated planting of them and not just one plant here and one plant there. Um, 
there's a resource that's especially um, important, and I'm going to go to a different page here. This is one of the resources that is available um, on that resource page, if you look that up. Um, share this. Um, you can see here that the caterpillar host plant is very different than the butterfly's favorite nectar sources. Butterflies will take nectar from a wide variety of flowers, but the caterpillars will only eat uh, a certain plant um, in the caterpillar stage. For example, this black swallowtail here is on parsley, dill, and fennel, that family of plants, including things like Queen Anne's lace and some of the other wildflowers. Although the adult butterfly will eat a wide variety of um, nectar sources. So you can see that um, there's a quite a difference between what the um, caterpillar eats and what the adult butterfly eats. Um, for example, here, um, let's see, where's the monarch? Um, of course, milkweed, we know that that is a host plant for monarchs, but they will land and eat nectar from a wide variety of flowers. These are only just two. I see a lot of them on cone flowers, um, especially. They like those um, things like uh, zinnias, those large flat flowers. Let's go back to our program here. Okay. Um, yeah, why are we not uh, moving here? There we go. Okay. Um, some things to consider when you're going to start or improve a garden that you want to attract butterflies. Um, one is it, most of them are in the sun. So don't panic right away if you don't have a lot of sun. We'll talk about that later. But uh, most flowers require five to six hours of sun for optimum bloom. And it's important also because butterflies are cold blooded. And so they need the sun to warm up um, in the morning to become active. A, a few flat stones um, in the sun would be warming surfaces that they could sit on. Sometimes just bare ground is a good place for them to sit also um, and warm up. Shelter is good too because if you have trees and bushes around your yard, it kind of breaks up the wind speed and makes it easier for the butterflies to fly. Bushes and trees also serve as resting places and places to hide from predators. They are also often the host plants for the butterflies, um, as many of the flowers aren't so much as a host plant, but many trees and bushes and shrubs are. Um, water is necessary for all living things and butterflies are included in that. Although they can get most of their water from nectar and dew, um, wet mud or sand um, places um, serve as what are called puddling areas for the males who collect minerals in, from the soil to gift them to the females. Butterflies are also attracted to salt. So adding a touch of salt to the water or the mud makes it even more attractive. You can also provide a shallow dish or plate um, with water as a watering place and adding a few stones to give them a place to land would help them be able to access the water. But just like bird baths, you need to change the water often to keep it clean and avoid mosquito breeding. And you also have to use very few, if any, pesticides because the caterpillars are eating the leaves of the plants and that's where the pesticides are. And uh, most larvae or caterpillars are killed by most chemical um, pesticides and if you have uh, pesticide use in your yard or the areas treated by your neighbors or municipalities right around your house and that may drift into your yard, um, you wanna try and avoid that if you can. Even organic pesticides like BT will kill caterpillars. It doesn't discriminate between good and bad caterpillars. And if treatment is absolutely necessary, 
spot treat specific plants carefully and not your whole garden. Some other things regarding pesticides. Be sure of the pest before you treat. Indiscriminate use of pesticides doesn't do any good at all. If you're trying to um, get rid of a pest and you're using the wrong pesticide, <clears throat> it won't have any effect and you may end up killing many good bugs along with it. Most chemical herbicides kill the adult and the larval stages of insects. Um, organic pesticides like insecticidal soaps, BT, which is that long name there, um, it's a special kind of bacteria that is targeted at um, caterpillar or larva stages of um, an insect. Horticultural oils, um, those all kill larval forms of many of the butterflies also, not just the bad guys. So spot treat only um, infected uh, plants and allow natural predators. We have a lot of bugs that are natural predators. Lace wings, ladybird beetles, ground beetles, and spiders are also good at um, controlling uh, many of your, our garden pests. Remember that the ugly bug you might want to squish might be the larval form of a butterfly. Here are some of them, and they, some of them are terribly ugly. The American painted lady is on the left. The Cecropia moth, if you've ever seen this, this is a very large moth which has what looks like two eyeballs on the lower wings. Um, the zebra long wing caterpillar is a kind of a spiky looking guy. Uh, the pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar in the lower right, he's real ugly. And the swallow bush, spice bush swallowtail caterpillar almost looks like a cartoon character. So when you're looking for some of these pests, you need to be sure of what you're spraying or trying to get rid of because it might be one of the good guys. If you're establishing your garden, um, you would need to determine what your soil type is. Do you have sandy soil like in the southeastern part of the county or are you up here in the northern part where we have clay? Some plants do better in one type of soil than another and it's fighting an uphill battle if you plant the wrong plant. It may last for a year or two. Um, it may not even make it through a season. So you wanna choose a plant that will grow well in the type of soil that you have. Um, does the area drain well or does it tend to puddle after a rain? Some plants prefer moist soil and some of them do not. Some of them will actually, the roots will rot right off the plant if it's wet um, too often and too much. If you're just starting a garden, take a soil test and that will tell you if you have any major deficiencies in any of the nutrients in your garden. Um, add compost or other amendments as is indicated by the soil test. Um, and you don't have to go overboard for most butterfly gardens if you're using native plants on any kind of fertilizing. Fertilizing tends to make the plants grow tall and leggy and they'll flop over. So you don't necessarily have to go overboard on the fertilizer end of it. If you have really bad soil or contaminated soil, you might wanna consider raised beds or containers for annuals. Um, I caution you about growing perennials in containers because containers get much colder during the winter than um, the soil in the container gets much colder than the soil in the ground. The soil in the ground is covered by snow and um, is often like 10 to 15 to 20 degrees warmer than would be the soil in a pot that's sitting you know, in your driveway or on the side of your house or on your front porch. Um, so you need to be uh, kind of careful about putting perennials in containers. Some things you can do if you have perennials in containers are put it in an unheated garage or actually dig a hole in the ground and bury the pot so that the plant is kind of like in the ground, like a regular um, in-ground plant. Or you can devise some kind of protective insulating um, combination around the planter or the pot. So those are, those are just some things to, con to consider if you're trying to do perennials in containers. Containers for annuals works really well because they're done at the end of the season. Okay, now for the plants. 
um, what kind of plants do butterflies like? Um, butterflies see red, yellow, and green. So these colors here, the warm colors, yellow, orange, pink, red, and purple, especially attract butterflies because those are part of that basic red, yellow um, color scheme. Um, butterflies also see UV light, so they may not see flowers the same way we do. Um, bees and some other pollinators also see UV light, so um, they may, the plant may look a whole lot different to an insect than it does to us. Um, buried bloom times over the season, so you want to have something that's blooming from spring through late fall, um, and especially like later summer and into fall, um, many plants sort of um, poop out by that time of the year. And so um, you want to have, be sure to have some like asters and that sort of thing that do bloom later in the season, because that's when uh, the time when migrating butterflies like monarchs are actually um, bulking up for that long flight to the south. Scent makes no difference to butterflies. In fact, there are some butterflies that are attracted to rotting fruits and, and dung um, as uh, places to lay their eggs and things like that. So that doesn't make any difference. Butterflies, however, do have sensory organs on their feet to allow them to sense if a plant is the right one for egg laying or if it's a good pollen plant or if it's a good nectar plant. So, um, just because something smells good doesn't mean it's going to attract butterflies. And large masses of a single color rather than single plants attract butterflies too, because it's hard to find that one single plant. But if you have a large um, planting of something or several plants at least of something, that makes it easier for the butterfly to find it. When you're looking at flowers, uh, single rather than double blooms are important for butterflies. They're a little bit bigger than a lot of our other pollinators. And so they need a place to land that's kind of appropriate to their size. So this traditional native coneflower on the left is an excellent plant for the butterfly to have space to land and also to feed. On the right, this double tufted, whatever it is, um, cone flower is hard for the butterfly to find the nectar source and also a little bit harder for it to land on. It's too much fluff and not enough solid landing space. <clears throat> Many of our um, plants are, are um, grown or developed from the native plants and in this case this is a cone flower um, but it's been developed for special appeal to people to look at, but it's not necessarily very good for butterflies. So they prefer simple flowers. Um, large flat flowers are really good. So you can see how they're landing on it and feeding on it. Or bunches of tubular flowers, for example, Joe pie weed and phlox and that sort of thing where there's multiple flowers where they can sit on one and feed on the one next to it. So those are some um, things to look for in, in plants when you're looking for flowers for butterflies. Um, I would also suggest that you stick with native plants as much as you can. Native plants evolved with the insects over thousands and thousands of years, and so they depend on each other. Um, the insects depend on the bloom times of native plants for food for the adults, and they also um, depend on the availability of the host plants for their eggs and their caterpillars. Um, although the adults may eat non-native plants, um, the caterpillars um, specifically eat only most of our native plants because that's what they were um, developed to eat over many thousands of years. So you can't just substitute a non-native plant for a native one and expect the larva to to be able to eat it. Um, the survival of an insect is dependent on a plant that has been coordinated by long established natural rhythms. Um, native plants are also hardy and can be dependent on by insects to be available when needed. They are very hardy. They have been through drought and heat and cold. 
um, and are able to survive all of those hardships, whereas many of our non-native plants, um, if they're not watered or they're not fertilized, they just kind of don't do anything or die. And native plants are often simple by design for function reasons, because that's what the butterfly uses and many other insects. They're not flashy. Um, they're not designed for, for um, high impact in a garden. And native plants are largely carefree. You don't have to do a lot of watering or fertilizing or anything. You just put them out there and they grow. Um, I'm gonna go back here to another screen. Um, let's see. Native plants for butterfly garden. This is another one that's on your list. And this lists um, native plants that are in the early season, for example, this would be late May, early June. Mid season would probably be June, uh, mid, late July, August. And then late season, we're talking about September and October. So these are some plants that if you plant some of these from each group, you will have a plant or two or three that are growing at the particular time of the year that um, they're needed by the butterflies. And this is also a nice handy chart because it tells you the color of the flowers, how tall it gets, what, what are the light requirements, um, do they do well in sandy soil or clay, and then also the moisture level that they like. So, um, and the, the um, key is on the bottom here that tells you what the different uh, letters mean. So this is a kind of a handy one. So you can look at this and say, okay, I have clay soil and I have, it's kind of damp most of the time, you know, which plants would work best for that? Or I have a, an area um, like some of these little suns here, it's a half sun, it's partial shade. Which plants will grow okay in partial shade um, rather than if I don't have full sun? So it's kind of a neat handy little chart. Let's see, go back to our program here. Okay. Um, you might see some plants which we call nativars, which means it's a cultivar of a native plant, often with a change in size, color, scent, composition, that sort of thing. So these are all um, native ours of cone flowers. Now, if you were a butterfly coming along and you're looking for our purple cone flower, which is the native, would you recognize any of these flowers as being your purple cone flower? Um, granted, they see UV light, so I'm not sure what some of these look like in UV light, but um, they are, the one on the left has the same sort of form, which makes it would be easier to easy to land on and use. Um, this one in the lower middle is kind of the same form, but it's a little bit, um, little bit bigger cone. The one above it is pretty fluffy. I don't know where the butterfly would land on that one. And the same thing with the one on the right here. Um, how do you know where the nectar source is on this um, cone flower? So when you're looking at um, catalogs for plants, you want to be kind of careful when you're looking at these cultivated um, uh, species, cultivars of different um, native plants. Um, do they really look like and work like, function like the uh, regular native plants? How do you know a plant is a native R? Catalogs or plant tags usually say the native name but also a second name, either in capitalized letters or in quotes. For example, um, Echinacea is a purple cone flower. Echinacea propria is the native uh, purple cone flower. If you see in a catalog, Echinacea mandarin double scoop, this is a native R. Um, and this happens to be a bright red, um, one of those double um, layer ones. It's got the, the pom-pom thing on the top and then the, the drooping leaves underneath. So this is a native R 
and um, it may not have the same characteristics or the same attraction for butterflies as a regular native plant. Many times native ours, if the breeder is um, copyrighted, so to speak, it's a plant patent number, you might see a number um, also on the flower. In that case, it is illegal to propagate those flowers um, by um, taking cuttings and that sort of stuff um, and selling them or giving them to friends. So it's something else to remember. Here's a list of native um, plants for butterflies. Um, most of these um, people might know. Um, some that's um, maybe not real, um, this bone set, I have some of this in my yard. It's a plant with very unique crinkly leaves and big, lots of clusters of white flowers. It blooms for a long time. And not only does it attract butterflies, it's just a buzz with all kinds of pollinators all the time. Um, bergamots are also known as Monarda. Um, blazing stars are Leatris. Uh, butterfly flower is the orange um, milkweed plant. Uh, Coreopsis has yellow flowers. Oxide daisy is the white daisy. Um, purple ageratum is a little purple, kind of a pom-pom shaped flower um, that uh, would be a native plant. Um, annuals for nectar. We said butterflies will be able to get nectar from a lot of different plants. And these are some that uh, would bloom for a long time um, all summer. That's the advantage of having some um, annuals also for nectar because these plants don't have a season like uh, native plants do. Some bloom in the spring, some bloom in the summer, some bloom in the fall. Generally, these plants, once you put them out or plant them, they will uh, grow all summer. And many of them are also good nectar plants for um, uh, butterflies too. Um, most of these are annuals. Um, occasionally some of them will reseed themselves from one year to the next. Um, and you might think that they're perennials, but they're actually reseeded annuals. Um, some perennials for nectar. And again, many of these are um, native plants. Um, the flocks that we think of as garden flocks um, is not a native plant, but it does come from a native plant. Um, so these are some perennials that are good sources for butterflies for nectar. Now we talked about before that butterfly gardens usually need five to six hours of sun. If you don't have a lot of sun, you can still have plants for butterflies. Um, and these are some of the plants that will um, attract some butterflies, um, although they're probably not their favorites. Um, what you might look at is this list, which is plants that grow in partial shade, and many of them often grow in shade also, or in sun, um, but they do better when it's part sun, part shady. So that could be like a part of a day in the sun, or it could be um, light shade, like you have um, trees that have been trimmed up quite high, so there's quite a bit of light, even though they're in the shade. Um, and so some of these will also work in either shade or sun. So there's quite a, um, a variety here. Um, some of them, like the, the dill and parsley, we, all, we think of these more as um, garden vegetable type plants or herbs, um, but that also, and the thyme also, but they also are um, nectar plants for butterflies. And in fact, the dill and the parsley are also host plants for butterflies. Um, some shrubs also are good for butterflies because of the flowers they provide or the um, host um, hosting for the butterflies. So um, although not, li lilacs and, and things are not, and azaleas are not native plants, they um, also do attract butterflies. And you might not think of trees as host plants for butterflies, but they are actually very, very important host plants for the caterpillars. Um, all of these, um, if you have them in your yard or nearby, will also uh, attract the butterflies for the reason that they are host plants. Um, 
And so it's good to have those. These also provide the shelter that's needed um, and the, the wind, um, wind protection for the butterflies too, and also um, protection from predators. So these are also very, very important plants to have um, for butterflies. Um, there are some herb and vegetable plants too that are especially important for um, <clears throat> host plants. The carrot family um, is a host plant for many of the swallowtails. Almost every year I go out at some point during the season and find a whole bunch of my carrot leaves just chewed right down to the main stem. And um, once in a while I get lucky enough to find the uh, culprit and it's usually a striped caterpillar and it is a black swallowtail butterfly uh, caterpillar. Um, they will also eat dill and caraway which are in the same family. Parsley is a host plant also for swallowtails. Catnip, hyssop, lavender are also host plants for various butterflies and the cabbage family. Um, you may have seen the little white butterflies fluttering around. Those are the um, butterflies that lay the green worms in your, <laughs> in your cabbage family. So they are the host plants for those butterflies. Um, just a reminder, if you butterfly garden, you have to expect that your plants are going to be nibbled on and maybe even devastated by caterpillars if you're planting them as host plants you will know you have succeeded by the tattered plants in your garden. So butterfly gardens are not necessarily show place gardens. So you are actually, um, if you're a successful butterfly gardener, they're actually working gardens which produce a product, namely butterflies. Um, there are some secondary benefits too to butterfly gardens. Um, Butterfly nectar plants are generally attractive to a whole host of other pollinators and we need all those pollinators for um, pollinating all of our crops and um, fruits and all the other things that we depend on for food. Uh, many birds are attracted to the larva and adults so your garden will also be visited by, by a, quite a variety of birds too as well as the um, pollinator or the butterflies. Um, I showed you some of the resources or flipped to some of them. There's a whole list uh, page called resources. Um, some of these websites are very interesting. If you want to know more about the butterflies themselves, the different species of butterflies, um, more about butterfly gardens, what are the host plants, um, these websites, the North American Butterfly Association, Wisconsin Pollinators, the Butterfly website, and Monarch Watch, if you particularly um, want to attract monarchs. These are some excellent, excellent websites. You can spend a lot of time looking at them. Um, also, uh, there's some, several books on that reference list. Um, that are important if you're trying to establish butterfly gardens. Some of them are references to identifying butterflies or identifying uh, caterpillars of butterflies. Um, if you really want to get into the topic and find out what kind of caterpillar you might have um, creeping around on some of your, your garden plants. Um, I always do a reminder um, and on all of my programs, um, from the um, master gardeners. Uh, when we do researching garden questions and stuff, these are some of the things that we do. Um, when you're searching for answers on the internet, enter your question and add the word extension. For example, when I was doing research for this um, presentation, I put in butterfly garden extension. And that will bring up in your search engine um, websites that are um, by extension organizations all over the country. What you need to do then is look for states that are near Wisconsin or ha that have the same type of climate as Wisconsin. For example, I would not be looking for sites that would be in Arizona or California or Texas because those have really, really different climates and plants and animals 
than what we have in Wisconsin. Um, some of the sites that are good for Wisconsin would be if you find something from the Minnesota extension, University of Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, Il Indiana, Purdue University is another big one, um, Penn State, um, and also some of them on the East Coast like New York, um, uh, Vermont, those kinds of places because their climate is also very much like Wisconsin. Um, these will give you the most accurate um, answers because everything on these sites have been researched and tested. There's no guessing about whether something is going to work or not. I would avoid blogs and dot com sites unless the information can be backed up by independent research. Many of the blogs and dot com sites are um, done by um, the blogs are, are often just uh, local gardeners, um, people who think they know a lot about gardening, but have never tested or tried anything for sure. Um, they're probably just um, going off of what happened to work for them or their neighbors. And many of the dot coms, of course, are by companies that probably want to sell you something um, and might have quote, research to back up their stuff, but it's not anything that um, you're going to um, you're going to be able to probably um, find out by other research that it's actually true. Um, that's about all that I have. If there's, if people have questions, some of the things, other things that we might um, want to talk about. If you have questions about some of the things that I covered, um, I'll be glad to answer anything. So Donna, uh, Anne had a few comments and questions that she uh, had placed in the chat while you were chatting along. So I'm going to let you know what those are. That was um, a comment. I see so few butterflies in San Jose. I have lots of flowers. Where have they gone? Um, also, I need a copy of that chart. I think that was the, um, the chart of the plants and everything, which is included. Um, yes. And if you're aware of which one specifically it is, you could let us know. I believe, but I believe anything that Donna showed, it looked like we had it in the handouts, correct? Yes. Okay. So it should all be available. I will make sure to um, send out another email with the link. It was included in the others, but I want to verify that uh, you do all get that. Um, and then she also commented, and I'm going to probably say the plant incorrectly. I have Budlia, but they do not Budlia. attract butterflies. Is that is that a myth? Um, if you're talking about uh, what they call butterfly plant, there's see there's common names of all of these, and um, when I'm talking about butterfly plant, I'm talking about a milkweed plant with orange flowers. Um, not quite as tall as regular milkweed. There's a plant called Bodelia, which a lot of garden catalogs and things like that call butterfly plant, but it's actually not a milkweed. It's something different. And so I would say, yeah, it might not attract butterflies. I've never planted it because um, it's not, it's not hardy for one thing in the zone where I live. It might be where you live if you're not living in zone four. If you're living in zone five or six, it would it would grow there. Yara said, I love the theme. I see butterflies and bees on my garden on Moringa ol Olefera flowers. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm butchering these. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> They're, yeah, recommend. they're Latin names and they're, they're tongue, tongue, tongue twisters a lot of times. Barb Gillespie asked, do you recommend an app to identify native flowers such as iNaturalist? Oh, I don't know about um, apps. Um, I'm just getting into the smartphone thing here. So, but I'm sure there's probably apps out there. I couldn't tell you right offhand what, what they would be. I know I just recently downloaded a couple and I've recently started playing with them. I don't know if either of them are specifically good, but I do know one looked very promising, 
Barb, I will check which one that one was, and I'll forward that to you as well if you want to play with the with that as well as the others that you've looked at to see if one looks like it's going to be better than the others. So I will forward that one. It looked like it had a scientific background, which is why I did choose to download that one because it looked like it was, as I said, promising. And I'll make sure I get that to you. Yeah, I see the one, do they lay eggs on new milkweed? Yeah, they like the new plants. Um, and you, <laughs> you may have to go and ask for milkweed leaf donations. Yes, um, I had, um, I let a red milkweed plant go to seed and I had little plants all over my garden last year. And all those little plants were just little twigs with no leaves on them because the butterflies do tend to prefer the either the newer leaves at the top of the plant or the more tender, smaller plants. Um, yeah, <laughs> you may not have any leaves left on your little tiny pulp milkweed. Irene, I see you have your hand raised. I'm not able to turn on your mic or anything, so I'm not able to give you a chance to speak. Um, you might need to use the chat or the Q&A feature, feature, if you're not able to access either of those, and I know we have one person on the phone as well, if you have any questions for me or for Donna, and you or you would like me to forward questions on to Donna, but you're not able to interact very well, um, my email is B Pearson, P-I-E-R-S-O-N, at marshfieldlibrary.org. And then you can let me know what those questions are and we can make sure we're able to answer those. Um, I just wanted to make sure because I, I'm not sure if you're able to actually access those features and that's why you didn't use them. And I wanna make sure you have that option. Okay, thank you, Irene. But that goes for everybody else as well. If you have further questions after this, or you want me to forward anything to Donna, please feel free absolutely to email me as well. So uh, Barb K was asking, uh, or Barb B, I'm sorry. Uh, was asking uh, or pointing out that she was unable to download load the previous lecture and worksheet. Uh, the link wasn't working for her. Is there an optional uh, route? Um, basically, is there an optional route to handle or receive those um, materials? I am actually working on putting together a way that you'd be able to ask for that information at either the adult information desk or the potentially the youth information desk at our library. So this is uh, only an option that is available to our local community members, but I'm looking to make sure that those materials are available to be requested to have them printed or copied for you. Um, I'm still working on putting that together as well as uh, this evening, I did attempt to see if I was able to put this on YouTube. And if so, if that works, I'm gonna be able to forward that information out as well. So if you weren't able to participate in the whole event, you will be able to catch that information as well. And I will include another email with updated information on how to get a hold of those physical copies. If you were unable to easily access them or you want paper copies and you don't have a paper cut or a printer at home or any of those issues, um, I will let you know about that when that has been resolved and figured out. And then I will also um, brain just died. I will also forward the link to the YouTube video if that works out as well. Um, but do we have any other questions right now? I would also like to ask if you have other topics that you wish to be covered in this program, um, write them in the, the chat here and on bar, um, Bethany will forward them to me. Um, I see we have one here. Are we going to do anything on prairie establishment? Um, that's a broad topic. <laughs> we'll have to take a look at that one possibly. Um, next month, I plan to do something. It'll be about the around the 20th of September or so. Um, and that's about the time when we have our first frost. So we'll be talking about what you do 
um, after the first frost in order to get your yard and garden ready for the winter and the best way to preserve the plants that you want to keep for the for the following season. Okay, last call for any follow up questions. I think that is probably it. So I am going to one more time thank Donna for joining us. And one more time, thank everybody else for joining us. I hope you have a great evening for anybody that has joined us from far and wide. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll hopefully see you next time. Bye everyone. And I'm just kind of curious, how do you people in California and Texas find out about this program? So Eventbrite is how I have everybody register online so that I'm able to okay. make sure they get an immediate email letting them know. And Eventbrite is not necessarily uh, set to just local. So people are able to search on Eventbrite for what is out there. And so we have people that are finding us across the, the country. I also have people from UK that have attended a few of our events. And I believe I have had a few people ask. We just had somebody said they're from Ohio, <laughs> Florida. I, I know we had, I believe, one person say that they were in Texas area. So yeah, we've had, a, oh my gosh, in Maryland. We might actually have one or two people from almost every state. Because <laughs> when I'm planning these programs, I'm thinking of locally. So, you know, these programs are more geared towards Zone four, Wisconsin, Minnesota, you know, Michigan type um, gardening type of things. So um, if you're coming from really far away, um, I might not have a, a program that you are, might be real familiar with or that might work in your area, but um, you can always use those extension resources to find out um, information for your area. Chris said it's still relevant information. <laughs> <laughs> But I am going to end this now. Thank you all for joining us. If you have any further questions, just let us know. Thank you. Yep, bye-bye. <laughs>